Amen. So you're there in 2 Peter chapter 1, and we are starting a new series. Uh, it's called Add to Your Faith. Add to Your Faith. And uh, in this chapter, we're going to see uh, multiple things that the Bible's teaching that we should add to our faith. Uh, and uh, I think this is a good lesson to, to learn. One is that these, these aren't automatically attached to your faith. And this idea of when you get saved, you automatically are just going to do everything you should be doing, or that, uh, you know, basically you've arrived, and, uh, and, and if you haven't arrived, then you're not really saved. You know, this is what a lot of people try to tell you, that, uh, you know, if you're really saved, then you wouldn't desire to do any sin, and you wouldn't, uh, basically, everything is already set in order, which is ridiculous. And so what this chapter is going to teach here is it's talking to believers, but then it, uh, the idea is that don't just stop at getting saved by believing, but add to that, you know, add certain things to that, and there's going to be a reason why you're adding that. So I'm going to uh, be hitting on the first one, and so there's a whole li- there's a list of different things we're supposed to be adding. Uh, we're going to be dealing with virtue as far as the first one we're supposed to be adding to our faith. But let's get the, the context and get kind of the introduction as far as what this is even talking about when we get to that point. Uh, in verse 1 there, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So who is he talking to? He's talking to people that have obtained faith. Okay, So we're talking to people that have believed and he's linking them in with them. So, so Peter, the Apostle Peter, is saying that you've attained like precious faith with us. So as much as Peter's a believer and has that faith, so do these, these people that he's addressing. So we're talking to believers here. And it says that obviously we've obtained this like precious faith through the righteousness of God, not our own righteousness. Okay, So salvation is not by our own righteousness, but it's actually by the righteousness of God that, we, that we're saved. Verse 2 there, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So we're being called to glory and virtue. And it says in verse 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And I'm going to be getting into this kind of the, the, the last portion of the sermon. And the, the idea here is that when you get saved, we have, you know, he, he hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life. That's present tense. You have that. But you have that inwardly. You have that in the new man or the inward man. And what this passage is going to be really talking about is the fact of tapping in to that divine nature that he hath given to us, meaning that this new creature uh, and the fact that we're, we've been made new and we're a new creature in Christ, and the idea that when you get saved, you can have that inwardly, but, you know, you may not be basically being a partaker of it, okay? And so this is really getting into how you do that. So in verse, uh, in verse uh, 5 there is really where we're getting into kind of to our series here as far as what we're adding to our faith. Because it says, in verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So, in verse 1, we see that we've obtained like precious faith. We have that faith. But we want to give all diligence to add to it. But what we're going to get to is that it's not, we're not adding to it so we go to heaven. We're not adding to it so that we don't go to hell. We're adding to it for a reason. And... It says, so here's what we're going to be adding, and tonight we'll be dealing with the first one there. Add to your faith virtue, and then to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And to me, it seems like this is the order, right? It doesn't just, sometimes you'll see a list, and it's not like necessarily to give you a particular order. But the way this is written does seem like to get knowledge, you have to have virtue first, right? Or in order to, ha- in order to add virtue, you kind of have to have the faith there first to, to add on the virtue. And then to add on the knowledge, you know, to virtue knowledge, right? And, and so uh, 
I'm going to be getting into what I believe it's talking about when it's talking about virtue. Um, but go to uh, 2 Peter uh, 1 and verse 8, because what I want to show you, because when we go through this, you're going to be like, why are we adding this? You know, what's the point? What's the end game? What's the result? Why are we doing this? In verse 8 here, notice what it says. For if these things be in you and abound. So notice that these, can, these things, first of all, can be in you, but are they abounding in you, right? You can have some virtue, but are you abounding in virtue? You can have some knowledge, but are you abounding in knowledge, right? So it's, it's one thing to add virtue. It's another thing to be abounding in virtue and going down the line with all the different uh, aspects there, right? Um, but for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, or I'm sorry, Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he is purged from his old sins. Now, people, you know, that aren't saved will look at this passage and be like, see, if you don't have these things, then you're not saved. It's like, it doesn't say anything like that, but it's basically saying that you're not going to be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, or our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you a, 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 an idea of what that's talking about. Now, this could just be talking about being, being fruitful in knowledge, right? You think about, like, the idea of, uh, uh, and this is definitely true, meaning that the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise, and the idea of being fruitful in wisdom and knowledge being added because of that, right? And that I very well, uh, you know, could be attached to this. But go to Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, because when I think about this idea of being fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, of what that might be talking about, <clears throat> because there's different types of fruit. There's the fruit of the Spirit. There's fruits of righteousness. There's, you know, there's fruit like an apple, <laughs> physical fruit. There's the fruit of the body, which is like a, a, a baby, right? But then there's the fruit of the, of the righteous, which is, which is a soul, right? Uh, a soul one, uh, when you, you know, a Christian begets another Christian. But <clears throat> being fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, I think about this passage, and this, it could be that we're dealing with this idea of uh, bearing fruit with his, about his knowledge. In verse uh, 53 here, in verse 11, or chapter 53, verse 11. So Isaiah 53, verse 11, it says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So it's kind of an interesting way of saying it. But obviously we know that Jesus, you know, by the knowledge of Christ, and, you know, obviously you had to know, you know, believe on Jesus Christ for salvation, and that knowledge of the death, burial, resurrection, and on Jesus Christ himself, that the, the idea here that being barren or unfruitful in the knowledge, if you're not abounding in these things, could be dealing with soul winning, which does link to Proverbs 11.30, you know, the fact that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise, and being fruitful and not being barren in that knowledge, the idea of, you know, if as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards in the manifold grace of God. And you've received that knowledge. You have the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but are you fruitful with it? So I'm not, I'm not necessarily here to, like, pin it down just on soul winning because this could be in a lot of different ways, meaning, like, you could just be th thinking about the knowledge of the Bible and the knowledge of Jesus himself, right, and being fruitful in that or being fruitful, obviously, in soul winning or being fruitful in other ways dealing with, uh, knowledge, right? But, but I definitely see how that could be linked to soul winning. But the idea of being barren or unfruitful in salvation, that's not there. <laughs> as far as like your salvation being barren, right? Or being unfruitful or something like that, that's not what it says at all. Now, when it comes to the, the, the converse to that, right? So if these things don't abound, then what does that mean? Well, in verse 9 there, it says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And notice this, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So you're definitely dealing with a believer that's been purged from his old sins. And it doesn't say that he's no longer purged from his old sins, does it? It just says he's forgotten that he has. Now let me ask you a question. What has been purged from sin? 
Is it your flesh? Or is it your soul and your spirit? And the idea is that when you live in the flesh, you can be desensitized to the point where you've forgotten that you even have the new man to walk in to the point where you're blind and all that. Now, let me give you a verse where you say, well, it says you're blind, you know. I was blind and then I saw, you know, and therefore, if you're blind, you're lost. You're, you're, you're unsaved. Well, look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16, we're dealing with the church of Laodicea and dealing with being lukewarm. And lukewarm, it just means something that's disgusting, okay? Meaning this is that I either want my drink to be cold or I want it to be hot. I don't want it to be lukewarm. And so, therefore, God talks about spewing these people out of his mouth because they're lukewarm. But it defines what that means in verse 16 there. It says, so then because you, th thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou, hast say thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. So why are they lukewarm? Why are they disgusting or detestable to God where he wants to spew them out of his mouth? Because they think that they don't need anything. And it says, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and blind. And what is this? Are poor and blind and naked. Now you say, well, he's talking to unsaved people, isn't he? Well, keep reading. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, and that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that, thy sh that, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love are rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Now, I don't know if you remember the sermon from this morning, but the Lord loveth whom he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And he doesn't chastise those that aren't his children. So he's clearly talking to believers here, and he's stating, you think you have it all, but you're really blind. You don't think that you need anything? And this is really a testament to the fact that you have faith, but you need to add to that virtue. You need to add to that knowledge. And going down the line, and, and you say, well, I have virtue, and I have knowledge, and I have all these different things. And you could say, like, you could try to pick out certain things. But the question is, do they abound? And you say, well, I think they abound. Well, but do they abound? And there's no measure to that. So, therefore, you should always be abounding more and more. The Bible talks about that when he's talking about, you know, you know that you, we, we know that you love each other, but we just, we're praying that you abound more and more. So the idea there is that even if you were to go down that list and say, well, I think I, I, think I have some of these, all of these things to a certain extent, then keep going and abound more and more. And never think that you've arrived. Paul the Apostle says, I have not attained. Neither were, were already perfect. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I mean, Paul the Apostle, one of the greatest Christians to ever walk the face of the earth, is saying, I haven't attained and I'm still pressing upward. You know, I'm still pressing toward that mark. So when, you're, when you think about this passage, you shouldn't look at this passage and be like, ah, that's for someone else. That's some, for some baby Christian there. No, that's for me. That's for you. That's for everybody. I don't care if someone is, is uh, you know, uh, 80 years old and has read through the Bible 200 times, <clears throat> has the whole New Testament memorized, been going out so long. Listen, you still need to abound more and more. And you still need to be adding to your faith all these things. If you don't, you're going to be barren and unfruitful. And just because you're unfruitful doesn't mean that you're not saved. And, and if, you, if you don't, then you're going to be blind and you're going to be basically just sitting in the, the old man, essentially. And not tapping into that divine nature. And obviously we're not when it says divine nature, it's not talking about us being God, okay? But the idea there is that we can be partakers with that divine nature because we can put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can, you know, we, we're filled with the Spirit and going on down the line with what this is talking about. Now, uh, go down to verse 10 there, or, for, or second, uh, second Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. <clears throat> and then... Because you may ask yourself, okay, why am I adding all this stuff? Well, that you're not unfruitful or barren, so that you're not sitting there blind and, and uh, forgotten that you've been purged from your old sins. Well, why does that matter, right? Because that's the question you would ask. Be like, well, why does that matter? You know, why would I, what's that going to, 
do to me, you know? And, you know, obviously unsafe people are going to be like, well, you're going to hell, you know? <laughs> but that's not what it says. There is a reason why you want to add these things, and there's a reason why you want to be fruitful, and there's a reason why you don't want to, be, to forget that you've been purged from your old sins and that you're, you know, basically being partaker of this, this heavenly calling and this divine nature. <clears throat> there's a reason for it. And in verse 10 and 11, I believe we're going to see the reason. Verse 10, it says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now, that's an interesting thing that actually at the end of the book, uh, which is not, a, I mean, chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3 of, of 2 Peter, it talks about not falling from your own steadfastness. So when we're talking about falling, we're not talking about, like, losing your salvation. But the re- you say, well, why, why does it matter if we fall, Right? Well, notice what it says in verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, every word of God is pure and every word is important. Notice that it doesn't say, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you into the everlasting kingdom. Notice it doesn't say that. It says abundantly. See, Jesus said that I, you know, that I go to give them life and that they may have it more abundantly. See, you could just get saved, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have life. And even at the very beginning of the chapter, it says that he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But the question is, is that do you just want to enter into the kingdom of God or do you want to enter in abundantly? So here's why you want to add to your faith. Because I don't know about you, but I don't, it, it's obviously fantastic, and we can never imagine uh, or even th- uh, fathom what it's going to be like to step into the kingdom of God, into heaven, and for all eternity to be with our Savior. And obviously, it's going to be great. But how much more would you want to have an abundant entrance where instead of just entering in, you have the Lord Jesus himself saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, that's just one thing that you can think of. You can think about the judgment seat of Christ and, like, the rewards, the crowns, the, the authority. You know, the, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. And so there's a reason why we want to add to our faith. I mean, there's other reasons that you can think about in the fact that you want, you know, thinking about being a, a good father or being a good mother, being a good husband, being a good wife, or just being a good Christian in general, and the idea that, hey, I want my... I, wanna, I want my children to turn out right, so therefore, I need to be adding to my faith virtue and the virtue knowledge because I want to not be unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I don't want to be blind. I want to know where I'm going, right? And, you know, just so many verses on the idea of walking in the light and not walking in darkness and stumbling and falling and all these different things um, that doesn't have to do with salvation but does have to do with uh, this life and the consequences that come with that, okay? So, <clears throat> so hopefully, just a quick synopsis of what this passage here is talking about is the fact that I'm talking, to, we're believers, and Peter's talking to believers, and he's stating, you have everything that pertains unto life. And God, it's, it's kind of like you have this, you need to tap into it. It's kind of like the, the, the thing that's being stated here is that you have it, why aren't you tapping into it? You need, to, you need to tap into what God has given you. And it's kind of like you have this gem or this, like, this, this godly new creation that God has made when you got saved, and then you're just like not doing anything with it. And the question that some may ask is, well, how do I tap into it? How do I, how do I walk in a new man? How do I, you know, how do I walk in, in the Spirit? How do I get filled with the Spirit? Here's a clue. Here's how you do it. Here's how you're a partaker of that divine nature is that you add to your faith virtue. And that's one thing that that we're going to be covering tonight is virtue. Now, you may ask yourself, well, what is virtue, (laughs) right? Now, you can think, I mean, just on the surface, most people would say, you know, when you think about someone that's virtuous, you think of someone that's righteous or good, right? The virtuous woman and, you know, thou hast done virtuously, you know, many women have done virtuously, but thou excels them all, right? And the idea of just being righteous or moral. And so if you were to just look this up in a dictionary, virtue would mean like moral excellence, 
goodness or righteousness. And I would say that that's what we're dealing with here in this passage. Now, there's another place in the Bible where virtue is mentioned. And actually, another definition of virtue is basically an effective force or power or potency. And meaning that this, this, this word virtue can be used in a different sense. Okay? And so when Jesus is walking and everybody's thronging him, and if you remember the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years, touched his garment... And the Bible says in Mark 5.30, for example, it says, And Jesus immediately kn- knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him and turned him about in, in the press, said, Who touched my clothes? And you'll see this in different Gospels where it says something like that. Or it would even say, like, that he healed all these people because virtue went out of him and all that. So you can definitely see how that could be more so in the sense of, like, kind of like his strength or power has gone out from him kind of thing. But in this passage, I definitely believe that we're dealing with the typical virtue that we're dealing with, right? We're dealing with uh, goodness or righteousness, and, you know, that is something worth to add. Now, listen, if, if someone that gets saved is automatic, automatically going to do the works, now what's the point of this passage? Riddle me that. Why is Peter writing this? I mean... If I was receiving this letter from me, I'd write him back and be like, why are you writing to this to me? I, I'm already saved. I'm a believer. It, I mean, ergo, I am righteous as far as, like, I'm doing everything I should be doing. And you know what? I'm, I will do the good works. I don't even crave any sinful thing. That's why it's ridiculous to have this mentality of when you get saved, uh, you're, like, sinlessly perfect holistically. And I, I do think that a lot of people that that don't understand this doctrine of the new man and old man, get, that's why they get sucked into this, this weird, like, if you're saved, you're going to do the good works. No. If you're saved, God wants you to do the good works. He's calling you to do the good works. There's a great reward for doing the good works, but he's not going to force you. And just as much as God did not force you to get saved, he did not force you to believe on him, he's not going to force you to add to your faith virtue. He's not going to force you to add to virtue knowledge and down the line. He's not going to force that. That is something you have to choose to do. And so virtue, I believe, is dealing with righteousness or goodness or uh, basically uh, keeping the commandments, essentially. Now go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And I believe this passage in 2 Peter and James chapter 2 go hand in glove. Hand in glove, meaning that adding to your faith virtue and adding to your faith works are what we're dealing with here. And we're not talking about getting saved by adding these works or this virtue to your faith. Now look at verse 1, because it's interesting that the chapter starts off with not adding something to your faith, right? Because when you add something, it, it's coupling it with it, right? It's, 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 it's putting it with it. Uh, and notice what it says here in James 2, 1. It says, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. So he's basically saying, don't add respect to persons to your faith. Don't be a respecter of persons. Don't have that attached to it. So the chapter starts off with like, hey, don't put that, don't add that part. But then it goes on to talk about adding works to your faith. So look what it says in verse 12 here. And this, this sermon isn't all about James 2 or anything like that, but I do want to show you that James 2 is really dealing with this idea of you're, you're a believer, but you need to add these things, and there's reasons why you add it. It's not just to add it for no reason. Uh, there are consequences for not adding it, and there's reward for adding it. Just as we saw in 2 Peter, there's... There's a consequence and there's a reward, depending on whether you add it or you don't. But with respect to persons, there's a consequence if you don't, if you if you do add it, right? It's kind of like the opposite because if you add if you add uh, respect to a person to your faith, then there's a consequence for that, and that means that you become a transgressor of the law. You're transgressing by doing that. You're sinning, so there is a consequence to that. But we're talking about adding stuff, not subtracting in this series, but I just kind of want to show you that it does work both ways. There's certain things you need to get off of that, right? You need to purge yourself from. 
And so, verse 12 here, it says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath shown no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. If people would read these two verses before they went into the famous passage of faith without works is dead, I feel like it would clear up a lot of doctrine. He's talking to believers here, and he's saying, breth- you know, he's saying brethren over and over and over again in these passages, and he's saying, so speak and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. It's talking about keeping the commandments of thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, and if, basically, if you break any of them, you're a transgressor of the law, and he's saying that you're going to be judged by the law of liberty, and you're going to have judgment without mercy if you don't show mercy, and then he gives an example of it right after that, of not showing mercy, and that's why it says in verse 14, What doth that profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? From what? Judgment without mercy. Because he didn't show mercy. And you say, well, how do you know it's talking about something that's uh, having, you know, him not showing mercy? Because of the example he gives right after that. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about someone not having mercy on their brother and sister that has need. And the Bible says that, that hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. It, and it talks about the fact that if we see our brother have need and we shut up our bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in us? And so the idea here is that we can't say that the love of God is dwelling in us if we're not helping out our brother. We can't say that we have some mountain-moving faith or this great faith if, you know, we're not actually doing the works. And so we need to couple those together because that, that work is going to actually increase your faith, perfect your faith. And this passage is really dealing with perfecting your faith, which honestly is what we're dealing with in 2 Peter chapter 2. Or I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 1, right? The idea of, like, how do we increase our faith? And the, the disciples asked Jesus that. They said, Lord, increase our faith. But if you remember the guy that, uh, that believed on Jesus, and he says, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. The idea that he realized, hey, I have faith, I believe, I'm saved, but listen, I have, I have some small faith here. I, I need to increase this. I have a lot of things that I'm not trusting in. I'm not, I don't have this mountain-moving faith. How do I increase that? Well, in this passage here in James chapter 2, it's giving you a clue of how you perfect your faith. How do you complete it, right? How do you, how do you, uh, you know, basically increase it to where it's going to be something that is very fruitful and abounding and all of that? Now, notice what it says in verse, uh, verse 18. There it says, Yea, a man may say... Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou, be- thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And it's just like this verse is just ripped out of context. The whole point is, is that you need to tremble. As believers, we need to tremble before the Lord and the judgment that he can inflict on us in this life. And he's, he's stating, you know, you believe that there's one God. It doesn't say you know, that the devils believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior and they put their trust in him, right? It doesn't say anything like that. It's like, of course the devils believe that there's a God and that there's one God. They understand that, but they're not putting their faith in him, nor could they be saved saved anyway because the Bible says that he had not taken on him the nature of angels, but he had taken on him the seed of Abraham. So there is no salvation for the angels. It's not like they could actually get saved anyway. But the, the whole point here is the fact that even the angels tremble just as much as when it's talking about the fact that even Michael the archangel durst not bring against the devil a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. And the idea of even these angels who are greater in power and might sti- still look to God as being the authority and the idea that they tremble before him. And how much more should we be trembling before our, our God and our, you know, obviously our father that can chasten us and can bring down judgment upon us in this world. He's escaped. So, son, we're talking about chastening. This is the perfect time. This is the perfect time. (laughs) So, keep reading there in James chapter 2, in verse 20. It says, 
But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And the, the, the key with this passage is that when it says, what doth it profit, my brethren? Dead is unprofitable. So if you're looking at, okay, it doesn't say a live faith anywhere here, but it does say profitable, doesn't it? So the opposite of being profitable is being unprofitable. The, the opposite of being dead is alive, right? So when we're talking about having dead faith or your faith is dead, it means it's unprofitable. And, I, you know, there, and, and if you want to, I've done a whole sermons on this to really go ad nauseum into each verse here. But really what we're dealing with is having unprofitable faith. You're not profiting somebody if you say to them, be ye warmed and filled, but you don't give them anything. That's that Pentecostal weird thing that's like, well, you know, if I say it and believe it, it's going to happen. It's like, no, you do it. That's, that's how it happens. This whole weird kind of uh, uh, over-spiritual type of mentality of like, I say it, therefore it happens. And so, but it says here in verse 21, it gives an example of Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith, faith made perfect. Now, when was Abraham justified by faith? At, when he offered up his son Isaac, or when, it's actually before circumcision, right? Circumcision happens in Genesis chapter 17. It states that he was justified by faith in Genesis 15, so we know that he had already received that righteousness by faith before circumcision. And so we, we know we're not talking about salvation, but it's stating that he was justified by works in another place later on. And so then it goes on to say, and the scripture was fulfilled, which, which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So what happened here? is that the prerequisite to being the friend of God is that you're saved, <laughs> that you have faith. But if you add works to your faith, you can, you can not just, you, not, you're not just saved, you're actually a friend. If you remember to his disciples, he says, I call you no more servants, but friends. And it even talks about like a friend knoweth his Lord's will. Sound familiar being fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, knowing God, and something, knowing God is, is a process that you're never going to get done with in this life. You know, when you get saved, you're known of him. But if you want to know God, you want to see God, that is, that, listen, if you tell me that you know everything about God, then I, I got some verses for you. Because none of us have arrived at that point. We're all constantly trying to know God more as we go on. And this is something that uh, we're, we're continuing to do it. And you say, well, how do I know God? How do I get to know God? Well, if, if you say that you know him and, and you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's what the Bible says. And that's not about salvation. That's just the idea that don't tell me you know God and you're, you're breaking all of his commandments. <laughs> and you're just like deep in sin over here. Be like, But I know God. I know, I know exactly what you know, what he's about, and all these things. It's like, no, you don't. You may be saved. You may be a believer, but don't tell me that you know God. Like, I'm going to come to you for the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the Bible. But then it goes on to say, and the scripture was fulfilled, which it said that Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto righteousness. He was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And what it's, it's stating there, it's not saying that you must couple works with faith to be saved. It's just saying that in order to be saved from hell, it's by faith. Okay? But there's other ways to be just before God. After you get saved, if you add works, now you can be just as being a friend of God. And there's this, this extra layer, if you will, on you're not just saved, you're a friend of God. You're not just saved, you're a disciple. Being a disciple is being fruitful and picking up your cross daily. That is, that's an extra level. That's, that's something that you have to count the cost for. Listen, salvation is free. But if you want to be a disciple, you need to count the cost, and you need, there's, there's going to be sacrifice. And that's a choice that you have to make. But the question is, you know, what do we do to... To do that, right? I mean, it, it, I believe this passage here in 2 Peter chapter 1 is a nice little outline, a simple outline 
I'm not saying it's simple to do. I'm saying it's simple to understand. As far as what do I need to do in order to basically be a friend of God, be a disciple, and to have this abundant entrance into heaven, right? And the first step is to add virtue, which is, which is righteousness. And so and I'm going to show you, at the, you know, here in a minute that this is something that is coupled with salvation throughout on, on famous verses that you've used out soul winning. And the fact that this is something, this is like the first thing you're supposed to do. You get saved, what are you supposed to do? Now, obviously, the first thing you're supposed to do is get baptized, but guess what? That's a commandment. So when it comes to this, it makes sense that this is the first thing that's mentioned is to add virtue. And, and how adding virtue then leads into knowledge, then leads into temperance and leans in, you know, so it kind of, it's like that will help this and this will help that. And it just goes down the line. So go to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and so I just want, when it comes to Abraham believing God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, that's, that, the righteousness that's imputed unto him is God's righteousness, and that's by faith alone. Now, Romans 4 will obviously show you that, but uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, notice what it says here. It says, Yea, Dallas, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So notice that the, the righteousness which is by keeping the commandments is, is our own righteousness. The righteousness which we get by faith is God's righteousness imputed unto us, right? And Deuteronomy actually backs this up. There's a verse in Deuteronomy 6. That the last verse in Deuteronomy 6 says this in verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So keeping the commandments, that's our righteousness. Believing on Christ that's his righteousness imputed unto us, which makes sense with the beginning of chapter 2 Peter, is the fact that it's basically stating that we've obtained like, like precious faith through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, right? So it, it all fits, right? But the idea here is that when we add virtue, we're adding in our righteousness to the equation, right? And so when we get saved, it's not like God's like, all right, be, don't keep any commandments, uh, listen, I'm not under the law, brother. I'm under grace. That means I can do whatever I want, you know? There's this weird, uh, hyper, like, great, I don't know what they call it. I forget what they called it, but it's basically this idea that, well, we're under grace now, therefore, the law doesn't, ex like, the law doesn't even apply to us anymore. Like, you can just go out and murder and commit adultery, and it doesn't matter. God doesn't view it as sin anymore or something like that. It's this weird doctrine. But here's, here's the, the truth of the matter. Our soul and our spirit are no longer under the law no longer under the curse of the law because we believed on Christ and we're completely made sinless spiritually. But guess what? Your body's not. <laughs> Your flesh is still under the law. You're, if it wasn't, it wouldn't die. No believer would ever die physically. But because our flesh is under the law, we're under the curse of the law, therefore so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. What's being judged? The body. The flesh. So when you think about, okay, why should I add virtue? Well, so I don't have judgment in this life, you know? That's number one. I mean, if you think about it, I don't want to be chastened of the Lord. So I'm going to do, uh, do righteously, right? At least try to. Anna, look up here and don't talk. All right, Anna, Clara, my child, <laughs> whoever you are back there. So when it comes to... Uh, you know, obviously there's rewards for doing virtuously. And the big reward I think of is the idea of having an abundant entrance into heaven. And not just having an entrance, but an abundant entrance and having rewards and uh, being blessed for all eternity because of what you did in this life. So let me show you some verses, some very familiar verses, of how this is coupled. How you get saved, what's the first thing you're supposed to do? What's the first thing that God wants you to do? Go to Ephesians chapter 2. So this is probably one of the most famous ones. This is on our invitation. Many of you probably use this verse all the time, out soul winning. 
Now, we're accused of leaving out verse 10, like, it, like, like I'm afraid of verse 10 or something like that. But Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, very famous for being verses about salvation. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so salvation is by faith, not by works. That fits with everything in Scripture. And if by grace, then it isn't no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So, all right, salvation is by faith, not by works. It's the gift. But then it says in verse 10 here, what's the next thing that's stated after you're saved by grace through faith, not by works? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Notice it doesn't say, must walk or you'll die and go to hell. It says that he hath created us unto good works. Like, he, he, he wants us to do that. From the very foundation of the world, he knew who would believe. He knew who would put their, their trust in him. And he's ordained from the foundation of the world that those that trust in him would, would do good works. So it makes sense that actually the first thing that you'd add to your faith is virtue, which is what? Goodness, righteousness. Because... Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, that's what it's stating. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. The problem is, is when people just negate verse 9 and just completely negate it and be like, you have to do good works to be saved. It's like, you just turn the whole passage on its head then. Then what's verse 9 even mean? It has no meaning at that point. You've made it null and void because of your wrong interpretation. So, in Titus 2, in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously, or I'm sorry, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I've heard people use this, like, what do you have to say about Titus 2, 12? It says should. That's what I have to say about it. There's a lot of things I should do. You know, I should eat healthy but I don't always do it, right? I had a cinnamon roll today. I'll confess my sins. It was delicious, though. But, you know, there's a lot of things you should do, but there's one thing you must do to be saved. When they said, what must I do to be saved, when the Philippian jailer said that, Paul and Silas said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's what you must do. Things we should do, go to church, read your Bible, live righteously, do good works, you know, going down the line. There's a lot of things we should do. But keep reading there. It says, looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. This is what God wants you to do. This is what he wants every believer to do when they get saved, is be zealous of good works and that they would go on unto good works that's what he wants. So no marvel that in 2 Peter 1, he's saying the first thing that we should add to our faith, once you're a believer, is virtue. Because that's consistent with what we see. Go to Titus 3. You're in Titus 2, go to Titus 3. Now, I, I, I quote verse 5 probably every time I, I, I give the gospel or I'm trying to give the gospel. I probably quote this verse more than any because I'm usually trying to like Tell people, hey, there's something different about what we're preaching here than what you've heard. You know, 1 John 5, 13 and Titus 3, 5 are like my two top verses that I'm usually quoting when I go out soul winning. But it says in verse 4 here, But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, in anywhere, does it say anything about, like, I need to be virtuous, I need to be good, I need to keep the commandments in order to go to heaven? Nothing of the sort. Completely by grace, eternal life. It's not by works. So, but the next verse goes hand in glove with what we're talking about, which is in verse 8, this is a faithful saying. <laughs> And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful 
to maintain good works. These things are good and what? Profitable unto men. So what are you dealing with? You're dealing with profitable faith. Those that have believed in God, he's constantly affirming that they should what? That they should maintain good works. And this is what we're supposed to be doing once we believe. This is the first thing that we're supposed to be doing is maintaining good works. And baptism is that first step of obedience, if you will. That's that commandment that's given to all believers is that you believe on Christ, you get baptized, and then you, uh, you observe, you know, basically you're being taught to observe all things. And so that's what we're supposed to do. That's the progression. And which is, you know, why <clears throat> people that don't, that aren't keeping the commandments, but they want all this knowledge, right? They want all this wisdom and knowledge, but they're, it's like you can't, you can't have the, you don't want the, the cart before the horse, if you will. You want, if you want, if you want knowledge and temperance and patience, both the kindness and all this stuff, get the virtue down first. Work on yourself, okay? Don't be worried about what other people are doing. Worry about what you're doing. Are you keeping the commandments? Are you doing what you should be doing? And then these other things you can tack on as well as you go down the line. And like I said, if you're, if you're someone say, hey, you know, I, I feel like I, you know, have virtue in some places and I have knowledge in this area and I have temperance and patience and, and stuff like that, that's great. And, I'm not, and, I'm, and I would say that a lot of people would probably have all, most all these things going for them, right, as believers, especially if you're going to this church because this church is not, this church is a working church. You know, this is a soul-winning church that wants to live for God, keep the commandments, and all of that, right? But it doesn't just say that you have these things, but that you, they abound. So let's say you have all of these on your, your list of things that you've added to your faith. Well, increase them. And listen, there may be some things that are really good. Maybe, maybe your knowledge is like, man, I just feel like I'm just getting it on the knowledge. But your temperance is horrible. <laughs> Or your patience is horrible. Or maybe your patience needs a lot of work, right? Or your brotherly kindness would be like, man, I'm just really getting with this, but I just really don't like my brothers in Christ that are over here. I need to work on that, right? Or charity or whatever. You know, so there's, there's, there's always room to improve on this. There's always room to be adding this or abounding in it. So don't tune it out. If you're, and it, listen, if you think that, that you've arrived in this area, then you, you're the one that needs to be tuning into this, Okay. Because wherefore let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. He that think, thinketh that he knoweth as he ought, knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So if you think that you know it all, then you don't really know as much as you think you know. And go to, uh, go to 2 Peter chapter 1 again. 2 Peter chapter 1. If I get a shirt that says uh, something about uh, this is going to be a short sermon and it says you keep using that word, I don't think it means what you think it means, <laughs> then I'm going to get another shirt that says be careful because you might be in my next sermon. <laughs> be careful what you say. I'm joking. That would be hilarious. But um, hopefully I don't go. Until, that, that last Wednesday was bad. So I saw the clock. I'm like, I had like a whole other page of notes too, and I was like, oh man, what's going on? Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 here, the thing that I want to point out, which I've kind of already pointed out, but I just kind of want you to see it, look at it, is the idea here that in verse 3 it says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So notice that we, ha- we have this, this, it's kind of like you have the ability, but are you using it? It's accessible, it's there, but are you tapping into it? Because then it goes on to say, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So it's the, the, the idea that, hey, you can be a partaker of this. Here's how you do it. You want to be a partaker of that divine nature? Then here's how you do it. You add to your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge and if you do these things and they abound, you're never going to fall and you're going to have an abundant entrance into the, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And so it's, it's kind of like this roadmap to see that. But no, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 17. And <clears throat> this is like the favorite verse for people that think, well, when you get saved, there's going to be some change. Like if there's no change, then you didn't really get saved. I happen to believe words have meanings. And meaning that I don't just read a passage and just be like, you know, I don't really care if it says some, all, or many. I'm just going to basically insert however many I want on this. It says in, in verse 17 there, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. So notice that's present tense. Are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, I happen to believe that all means all. I happen to believe that that's in present tense and that's not something we're looking for. So what are we talking about then? We're talking about the fact that we're a new creature in the inward man. It talks about the hidden man of the heart, which is not corruptible. So when we're talking about this new creature this divine nature that we can tap into, that we can be partakers of, then we're talking about the fact that, hey, when we get saved, if we're in Christ, then we're a new creature. Our flesh isn't, though. Romans chapter 8 hits on this really well in the fact that our body, our flesh is still waiting for the, you know, it talks about how the creation groaneth and waiteth, and we ourselves also groan, and it says, waiting for the redemption, to, or I'm sorry, waiting for, uh, basically, to wit the redemption of our body. And so we're waiting for what? The resurrection of the body, to where our body is then completely sinless, and it's a new creature, and all of that. So one day, this verse will be true holistically, soul, body, and spirit. We're not in that day, though. Right now, our soul and our spirit our spirit is without guile, and our soul has been purified by the Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. And our soul and our spirit don't have sin, and it's completely cleansed. It's a new creature. But we still have the flesh, and you have to choose every single day whether you're going to live in the flesh or live in the Spirit. And this is why Paul says, I die daily. This is why the Bible says that you need to pick up your cross daily, because it's a daily choice that you have to make. Now, go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22, just to show you some verses on putting on the, the new man here, or what I'm talking about, because that's what I believe this passage is talking about. This passage isn't talking about getting saved. The, the very first verse is stating that you're already, they're already saved. They're already obtained faith. They've already obtained the promises. The, the question is that in this life, are you utilizing it? You know, are you, are you letting your light shine or are you putting it under a bushel? Are you being the salt of the earth or have you lost your savor? You know, the, the idea there is that um, this passage in 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1 is giving you a roadmap of how you let your light shine, how you walk in the spirit, how you put on the new man. And in verse 22 here it says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, if when you get saved, that's an automatic thing, then why is he saying to put it on? Right? I mean, what would be the point of saying to put it on? So, that means, in another place it says you have put on the new man, right? So, when you'll see, some places it'll say, you are this, and another place you need to do that. You need to become this, right? Or you need to put this on. It's kind of like putting on clothing, right? Do you put on the spirit? Do you put on, you know, the new man? Or do you put on the old man? You have a choice. When you go to your closet in the morning, which one you're going to walk in? And, and don't get me wrong. It's not like in the middle of the day, you're like, I can't switch now. You know, I'm not by my closet. You know, like, obviously, during the day, you can choose to say, hey, no, I'm going to put on the new man right now. 
But it's kind of a way of thinking about it as far as putting on clothing and the idea, are you putting on that new man that's been regenerated or are you putting on the old man that's still dead in trespasses and sins? Romans chapter 13 says it in a different way, and this kind of gets into that idea of the divine nature or partaking in divine nature because what you have to understand is Christ in you, the hope of glory, is that especially in the New Testament, we have the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of us. We have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit is there living inside of us, and are you going to tap into that or not? Are you going to be filled with the Spirit? Are you going to walk in the Spirit? And in Romans chapter 13, verse 13, it says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So notice it's saying put on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It's kind of like putting on Jesus as a garment, if you will. But the idea there is that that new man, that inward man, you know, Christ in you, you know, Christ abiding in you. But if you're sinning, the Bible says, he that abideth in Christ sinneth not. So in order to abide in Christ, that means you have to be keeping his commandments. Because sin, by definition, is the transgression of the law. Go to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, it says this in verse 16, it says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Sound familiar? To putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In verse 16, it says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it says in verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So here's the contrast, right? You have faith, walk in it. You're saved, walk as a saved person. Not to stay saved, not to uh, validate that you're saved, but the fact is, is that if you live in the Spirit, then you should also walk in the Spirit. If, you know, and another place it says this in Ephesians 5, it says, you were you are sometimes darker, but now are you light in the Lord? Walk as children of light. You are light. Walk as children of light. Right? This is why Jesus says, if the, the light that's in you be darkness, how great is that darkness, right? If you're veiling the light that's in you as a saved person, do you realize how dark that flesh has to be in order to veil it? But notice that the light's there. It's not like the light went anywhere. It doesn't say that you put out the light. It's just saying that you're basically veiling it. You're covering it with a bushel. But if you covered a candle with a bushel, does that mean the light's not there? Does it mean that, that it's, it ceases to exist? It just means that you're not showing it to anybody. It's not helping anybody. It's not profitable to anybody. And in Colossians 2, it says something very similar. In Colossians 2, 6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, according therein, with thanksgiving. And this is really what we're getting down to is the fact that, hey, you believed? All right, it's time to get rooted, grounded, settled in it. How do you do that? Add virtue. Add virtue to your faith. That's the first thing you should be looking at. Anybody that gets saved, the first thing you should be thinking about is, okay, I need to figure out what God wants me to do, and I need to try to do it. And we're all, we're all, we all come short of it. None of us are have arrived in this area, so we're constantly trying to purge ourselves from sin and purge ourselves from things that, that would cause us to not be virtuous, but this is the first thing that we're going to be dealing with, or the first thing on the list there is add virtue, and so I think this will be, hopefully this will be a good little series to really kind of give us an idea of, okay, here's how we walk in the new man, here's how we tap into that new man that God has created in us, and um, also to help you understand this passage that it's not talking about losing salvation or falling from grace, you know, like where we, you know, you're saved, but now you're lost. No, this is talking to Christians, and it's giving you the reason why you want to add all this stuff to your faith. Okay, so let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word, and just pray that you be with us throughout the rest of the day, and just pray that you would, uh, uh, give us uh, safe travels, but also uh, with the soul winning marathon coming up on Saturday, I pray that you would uh, prepare the hearts of the people that we talk to, and Lord, just pray for many souls to be saved, I pray for all those that are going to be coming out that haven't gone soul winning before, that, uh, that this be a good experience for them to get 
on fire for the things of God. And Lord, we love you. Pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.